The number of times I've read, preached, and written about this story, I've always assumed that what John is asking us to do is to make a choice. Will you be with Team Mary or will you be with Team Judas? After all, none of the other gospel writers bother telling us the names of these two opponents. Matthew and Mark just say some woman came in with a jar of expensive ointment. Luke calls her a sinner for some reason. Matthew and Mark say that it was the disciples in general who were complaining about what she did. Luke says it was a Pharisee for some reason. Only in John's gospel do we hear the names of these two people. John could not have chosen more diametrically opposed people to represent the two sides. In one corner of the ring, we have Mary, not Mother Mary, not Mary Magdalene, but Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, the pure-hearted Mary, the, the worship first, do the chores later Mary, the one who somehow always gets that when Jesus is in the room, the very presence of God is in the room. In the other corner, weighing in at 30 pounds of silver and an even heavier bone to pick is the infamous Judas Iscariot. Cue the jeers and the boos, because if there ever was an antagonist in the story of Jesus, it's him. Storytellers and screenwriters know that if you want to draw the reader into the story, give them characters to identify with and give them characters to cheer against. John knows what he's doing. Are you with Team Mary or are you with Team Judas? Are you on the team who will give Jesus your whole heart and your worship? Or will you be so troubled by the worries and pressures of life that you will forget to give Jesus the glory that he deserves? Well, that's the way I've always understood this story, even, even coming to the conclusion at times that there is a little bit of Mary and a little bit of Judas inside each of us. But, but what if there is a different way to understand this story? What if, what if Mary is not intended to represent us at all? What if Mary's actions instead show us something about God? And what if there is more of Judas in us than we care to admit? The great preacher and writer Barbara Brown Taylor suggests that what Mary is doing in this story sounds awfully familiar when it comes to the Bible. She says that Mary is acting like an Old Testament prophet, the very messenger of God, offering a, a vivid, unmistakable visual image to anyone with ears to listen would hear. I mean, think about the crazy and outlandish things Old Testament prophets did. There was Ezekiel eating a scroll to remind people to carry God's message inside them. Jeremiah walking through a public square, carrying an oxen yoke, calling people to obedience and surrender to God. Isaiah walked around barefoot and naked as a sign of judgment to the nations. I mean, this is what prophets did. They were shock performance artists. They did the irrational and the eye-catching. They raised eyebrows in order to show people something about God. Think about it. If, if Mary were representing us human beings instead, then that jar would be filled with just ordinary oil. She'd be anointing the head of Jesus, not the feet, because that's what humans did in those days in order to crown kings and establish earthly power. She certainly wouldn't have let down her hair was a cultural no-no at the time for women, let alone use her volume of hair to clean up the ointment, something I gave up being able to do a long time ago. What if John isn't inviting us to be like Mary as much as he is inviting us to be in awe of God, to behold God's lavish love and amazing grace? Everything that Mary does in this story is over the top, she doesn't just open the jar, she breaks it. Just as God breaks the power of sin and the earthly confines of our human sinfulness. She uses not some ordinary oil, and, and not just the most expensive oil around, but gushes out an extravagant amount of the priciest oil anywhere, some 30,000 worth in modern day dollars. And she is not anointing the head of Jesus to show us that the way of salvation is through earthly power. 
She's anointing the feet of Jesus, an act of burial, a foreshadowing of death, in order to show us that the way of salvation is the way of love, the way of self-sacrifice and, and generosity and service to others, rather than the way of greed and selfishness. Well, if that's what is happening in this story, then what John is telling us is this, God's love is abundant, it is extravagant, and it will go to any length to save humanity from its sin and brokenness, even if it means going to the cross, even if it means meeting death itself. You know, the other part of this story that I find fascinating this time around, it's a line that I've never really noticed before. It's in verse three. After Mary broke open the jar of spikenard, John says that, quote, the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. I bet it did. I bet the aroma immediately filled that room and lingered for days. But think about the fact that of all five of our human senses, our sense of smell gets very little play in the Gospels. Sight is the most dominant, of course. I mean, blind people see. The transfiguration turns Jesus into a dazzling white. Hearing is everywhere. Deaf people can hear. Jesus calls his disciples. I mean, even touch and taste are all throughout the Gospels. A woman is healed by touching the hem of Jesus' robe. And, and hungry crowds are filled by a miraculous feeding. But the sense of smell? Only John remembers that we have a nose. And there are only two times when we get to use it in John's gospel. The second time is here, when we take in a full whiff of this expensive ointment. And the first time is just one chapter prior, when Mary herself is in a very different state of mind, a state of grief in the presence of death. Her beloved brother Lazarus had been dead for four days before Jesus finally showed up. And even as they were pondering the possibility of Jesus healing him, what they were worried about, I mean, what they were really worried about was the smell, the smell of death, the stench of Lazarus's body that would pervade their home. So what happens in this story today shows us the lengths to which God can eradicate the stench of sin with the overwhelming, abundant, and lavish aroma of God's grace and love. Five years into living in a small town in Iowa, my daughters and I experienced our first skunk attack right in our own home. Eight o'clock on a Sunday night, our dog Micah was barking incessantly under our backyard deck. I was in the bedroom and I asked my girls to go out and see what she was fussing at. Didn't take long to discover what she was up against. It wasn't the sound. It wasn't the sight. The first thing that alerted me to the presence of pure dread was the smell. The skunk had met our poor puppy under the deck and rendered the poor thing helpless, rubbing its nose furiously against the grass. And even though all our windows were closed at the time, the foul odor had found a way to drift from the underside of the deck into every sorry surface of the main floor of our house. It smelled like a putrid mixture of burning rubber and locker room sweat and decomposing roadkill. That's the best way I could describe it. I went into the living room to find Grace, now huddled in a ball on a couch, the shock too strong for words. Maddie ran for the kitchen to find something else to bury her nose in. A jar of peanut butter was the first thing she could find. I frantically Googled every home remedy I could find, and after a trip to the grocery store, I returned with, a, with an arsenal of five large scented candles, clean linen fragrance, a giant jug of vinegar and disposable bowls for placing around the house to soak up the odor, a box of mothballs to sprinkle under the deck and drive the skunk away, and several cans of room deodorizer, which did very little against the odor but made me feel like I was at least trying. It was a pretty miserable night and a very long week. And as John would know, a stench like that lingers for a long, long time, especially the stench of sin and death. And just like I could not remedy that odor on my own, we are helpless when it comes to eradicating the power of sin and death in our lives. 
And that's where God steps in to break open the most lavish kind of odor fighting fragrance there ever was. God's amazing grace and God's redeeming love was poured onto the feet of a Jesus who took our sin and nailed it to the cross so that the fragrance of love could fill our lives. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, 14 to 16, that in Christ, God has released the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. He says that we ourselves can smell like the aroma of Christ's offering to God, both to those who are being saved and to those who are on the road to destruction. He said that we smell like a contagious dead person to those who are dying, but we smell like the fountain of life to those who are being saved. That is what Mary was showing the disciples. And that is what God is showing us. An amazing, extravagant love that we could not conjure for ourselves or provide on our own. And all we have to do is let go of our efforts to save ourselves and cultivate God's forgiveness and grace and just breathe it in. Let us pray. God, thank you for meeting us in the depths of our sin and offering the only way to remove it from our lives. You have loved us with a lavish and extravagant love and showed us that the way to life is through giving ourselves to others, just as Jesus gave himself for us. Teach us to breathe in your grace and to exhale sin and brokenness. Show us how to love in Jesus' name. And let all God's people say, Amen.